the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. You guys look good this morning. Look at the person next to you and say, you look good today. Let them know, let them know you're not, you're not just saying that. And I'm not, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not just, just saying that. All right, good. Uh, hey, listen, as, as Faith just mentioned, um, yes, tonight starts Declaration 2022. This is our first time that we've ever started a conference on a Sunday night, okay? So we're starting on a Sunday night. We're going a Sunday to a Sunday. And, um, and you're going to want to be a part of this, okay? Because uh, some of you, you need this. And you don't even know it, but you need it. Because um, I'm looking at you. And some of you, can we just, can we just be real for a second? We've had a we've had a cray cray two years, yeah. yeah. And 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 let me just like Darren needs this, okay? Like okay, all right. Like like, like I'm need, I'm gonna drink deeply this week. How about you? Yeah. And it all starts tonight. So make sure that you get here tonight. Um, and as Faith also said, one of my favorite people on the planet is here. Bonnie Shada is here with us this morning, and you are ministering tonight. Bonnie wrote the forward uh, uh, to my last book, Carve, which you already know because you all own it. Um, she, this is the one. She is here. Ah, this is so cool. Ah, it's going to be, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so tov. Now, um, if you are with us uh, and you're new or newish here, we've been going through um, the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, um, verse by verse, and actually word by word. So we actually spent three months just in the first chapter. Okay, uh, we're in the second chapter. I joke around. I say at this this rate, by the time we're done with Genesis, I'm going to be retiring, getting my bass boat, and Peter's going to be stepping in uh, to pastor the church, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to that time, you know? So anyways, um, but I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying uh, Genesis. Right now, you guys, we are in Eden. So we've been studying um, this Eden thing. And how many of you, you've had kind of like a Sunday school uh, version of Eden and the garden in, 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 in your minds. And some of that has been changing as we've been going through this, this study. How many of you, uh, your, your traditional uh, uh, way of looking at this text is, is changing? I, I know that that, that, that is true uh, for, my, for myself. For example, okay, God created the world in, in six days. And then some of us have been taught it was such hard work, okay, that on the seventh day, day, God had to take a nap, okay? And so on this, like God, he was just, uh, like each day, all that, all that talking, you know, how many of you are kind of like God for the first six days, or, or kind of like a pastor, you talk for a living? Okay, no one? All right, all right. You know, you know that talking is hard work. So we've been taught, you know, on the seventh day, God had to rest because he needed, he needed a break, right? And one of the things that we learned is that on the seventh day, God Sabbath, okay, this idea of Shabbat, which actually means to return back to the seat and to sit down. One of the things that we've been learning is that when God created Eden, which wasn't a garden, he planted a garden in Eden, that when God created Eden, he was actually preparing for himself a temple-like dynamic. He was preparing for himself a sanctuary and temples Always, well, nice temples, glorious temples, always had nice and glorious gardens. In fact, when you're reading the Eden account and the way that it's situated, all of a sudden we begin to see these parallels between Eden and the tabernacle. And to think that on the seventh day, God came into this place. He's, you see, for most of us, we were taught that God was creating all of this unto the glory of mankind. 
unto the glory of, of Adam. Okay, so God creates everything and there's all this dirt and God says, you're a gardener, now work in the dirt. But what we actually see is that God is preparing for himself a, 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 an abiding place. And we see these parallels between um, the garden, um, the tabernacle, and even what I call Eden 2.0 in Revelation 21, where the new heavenly uh, Jerusalem comes down and, and, um, and kisses the earth and there's the restoration of all. And when you read Revelation 21, you're going to read of the same stones that were in the Eden to see all of these parallels between Eden, um, uh, the tabernacle, and the new Jerusalem that is coming. Are we having an earthquake or what? Is that, uh, okay, it's Children's Church. Okay, good. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Okay. A West Coast rumble. It has begun. All right. This is going to be a wild weekend. All right. Whoa. Goosebumps, goosebumps. Okay. Now, here, here's the, it's the first time the kids have ever rumbled. Okay. It, this is a big deal. Why is this a big deal? Because as we read Genesis, we begin to see the origin story, the blueprint for humanity. And if we want to know where we're going, then we need to go back to see where we came from. We need to see what God first established in the beginning so we can begin to get a glimpse at our job description, our role, so we know how to engage, lest we be duped into this idea that a thousand more years of church services is going to transform everything. No, there's a battle, and the battle is that there would be an awakening in the body of Christ, that we'd be awakened to who we are, and that we be awakened to our function within the earth. And this is what we see in Genesis. So um, last week, what do we see? We see the, the fruit of the Ruach of God, of, of Yahweh Elohim, breathing into this creature of clay. And it says that the Ruach, the breath of God, comes from the mouth of God. And where does it go? Right up old Adam's nose, right up his nostrils. Okay. So we have this dynamic of the breath, the, the, the swirling breath of Yahweh Elohim, the breath of God, the mystical, um, uh, celestial breath of God, the presence of God, who he is, the gods of the consciousness of God, going and mingling with the earth, bringing about this, this, this animation from the clay. And there in that moment, Pinocchio becomes a boy. <laughs> Abba, the very first thing that, that mankind sees is Father God smiling down at his image bearer. Now, here's this creature, here is humanity, here is this thing made possible, it's, it's earth and it's heaven, what's earthly and what's heavenly. Where does earth begin? Where does heaven begin? We don't know. And the same dynamic is true of Eden. And so we've got all these things that are natural. We've got all, and, and we wrestle, we wrestle with this. Why? Because we, we pray on earth as it is in heaven. But we're going to be very surprised one day to realize how earth-like heaven is. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah, so here is, here is Eden, and, and, and where does heaven begin, and where does earth begin, and what's earthly, and what's, and, and religious people love this, what, 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 that's secular, and this is sacred, and is this, is this Christian music, or non-Christian, listen, in Eden, it was all holy, it was all glorious, it was all created by God, and it was all good. And you couldn't discern what was earthly and what was, we know we've got four rivers and we've got two that we know of. And then we've got these two heavenly rivers that nobody knows. Are have. Maybe they dried up. Maybe they're still in Eden. We've got a hybrid location, heaven and earth, a convergence point. We know that it's an elevated place. We're going to read in Ezekiel that there's a mountain in Eden. We're going to, we're going to see that there's trees in Eden. We're going to be studying today. This is the abiding place of, of God. Eden is a hybrid heaven and earth. We've got hybrid beings, which are these 
these image bearers, these, the, 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 that God says, let us create mankind in our own image. We know that God would give to Moses this instruction to um, not make any sort of image uh, in the image of God, right? Don't make sort of imagery that would personify, represent who God is. Why? Because it's already happened. God said, I already made an image bearer. It's my sons and my daughters, and I did a good job because I said it was good. So I have already done it. You are my image bearer, so you do not need to turn wooden objects or stone objects or any other objects to represent who God is because you are my representatives. You are my little photographs. You are my image bearers. You are my gift to the earth, a revelation of who I am and what I am like. Okay, so then he says, okay, now here you are, you're out of this, welcome to my tabernacle, welcome to my place, and my tabernacle's got a garden, so I'm going to need gardeners, and this is what we talked about last week, this Edenic mandate, okay, and this, uh, this mandate is to, um, the 2.15, um, they put him in the garden to, to work it, everyone say work it, and to take care of it, say take care of it. And we looked at these, these two, two verbs, okay, which I butch, butchered horribly last week. I'll, I'll, I'll butcher them again uh, today. It won't be as, as bad. Last week I said, everybody say, ah, bad. You're like, ah, oh, bad, like so sad, too bad. It's not actually ah, bad. Apparently that's, uh, the B is actually a V, and it's actually ah, ah, bad, okay, avad, perhaps. I, I don't know. Where's Patty? Is it avad? Avad. I would say avad. Okay, awesome. And then last week I said uh, Shamar. So I was like, Abad and Shamar. So it's like two kids I grew up with. Not a good story there, right? They're like, <laughs> we're, not, we're not hanging out outside of 7 Eleven, Abad and Shamar. All right, so here we go. Um, sh- it's not actually Shamar, it's actually sh- 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 Shamar. It's like they roll the R. Okay, but here, here, here's the thing. It, it doesn't actually mean, okay, to um, uh, the English idea to work, to work the ground and to take care of it. Why? Because these two verbs, what's, what's so fascinating is that these are verbs, okay, that are not used by those who are experts in agriculture. These are verbs that are always used in the context of a Levitical priesthood that are preparing a place for worship. So here what you don't have is just a vegetable garden where God likes to walk through the cool of the day. No, here what you have is a temple where God has sat down. Here's God in the temple, surrounded by his divine counsel. We'll get into that. Um, uh, he, he is here um, on the mountain in Eden. We'll see that in Ezekiel as we get into, as, as we get into that. Um, and, and here we have a people that God has not just prepared to be gardeners working in soil, but he has actually prepared for him a priesthood to prepare the earth for worship. And then the second verb, which means to be watchmen, to be guardians, to be gatekeepers of the holy place. And the great vision, the great Edenic mandate to subdue the earth, to take dominion, is that this temple would grow past its current boundaries, that the whole earth would be the temple of Yahweh Elohim. He would sit in the garden. He would sit on the high place. He would sit on his mountain and his children, the priesthood, the company of image bearers would prepare the earth and steward the earth. The ground would be, um, would have ownership. It would be cultivated because we saw in Genesis chapter 2 that for a season the earth was unclaimed and uncultivated, which is what brings us to 2022. Many of us watch the news. Many of us drive the streets of Seattle. Many of us are in this place where we are complaining. Why? Because we see an earth that is unclaimed and uncultivated. We need a blueprint. We need to know who we are. We need to know his original vision that his throne would be established on the earth. That he would be seated. And that there would be a priesthood, a company, a family that would rule and reign with him. But there were two trees in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. 
We're going to look at one verse, and we're going to skip ahead because we've been in 10 to 15 for the last two weeks. So we'll look at 9. We'll skip ahead to uh, 16. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. And we say tree of life. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil was also in the garden. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, of it, you'll surely die. Or as some translations say, you'll be doomed to die. So again, sometimes... We've got the Sunday school version of a vegetable garden, okay? We've got two trees, and of course there's one tree, and it's an apple tree. And in the apple tree is a talking snake, okay? Of course, all snakes talk, right? And we, and, we, and we think, wow, okay, so there's two trees, and there's a tree of life, and there's the tree of death, and the tree of death is an apple tree with a talking snake, okay? This is what we're going to be talking about. Today we're looking at the two trees, but we are going to talk about the serpent. What, was he actually a snake? Um, did he crawl on his belly, or did he walk, okay? Um, did all animals talk in the garden? We're, we'll, we'll get into this. We'll have some fun. we got some time the rest of our lives. Okay, good times. Um, <laughs> now, we see here that we've got this tree. It's called the tree of life. Now, for many of us, we've got this idea that, um, that in Eden, you just automatically had the immortality hack. So if you were born in Eden, you were automatically, by nature, immortal, okay? This immortal being. Um, and yet, we see an invitation from Father to receive of and eat of this tree of life. Which, by the way, when you look at the Hebrew word there, given for this tree, it's not necessarily spoken of in a way where it's talking about unlocking life for all of eternity, okay? This is not an eternal life tree. In fact, when you look at the, um, the definition for this tree, it's actually speaking of a tree of prolonged life. In fact, when the Israelites would talk about the tree of life. And by the way, the tree of life is mentioned all throughout the scriptures. Uh, Solomon talks about the tree of life, even in Revelation. To he who overcomes, you'll eat from the tree of life. Um, you see that this idea of a tree of life is not necessarily a foreign concept. But it is this place where, even referred to as a tree of youth, that as you engage with this tree of life, not once, but as you have a lifestyle of eating from the tree of life, it unlocks life abundantly, life Perhaps, you know, like this concept is as long as you are engaging with the tree of life, yes, it unlocks immortality. But this is not the place where you eat of it once and it's a done deal. What am I saying? I am saying that life, I believe, was sustained by continually engaging with the tree of life. We see that Solomon refers to the tree of life, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 16. Long life is in her hand. This is in the context of wisdom, okay? You engage with wisdom, and this just, this just makes sense, okay? Um, long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take a hold of her. That is wisdom. Those who hold her fast will be blessed, right? We teach our children about engaging with the spirit of wisdom, not just one time, but this is the lifestyle of engaging the wisdom of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom. And as we, what my wife calls, make wise choices, naturally years will be added unto your life. And that's not even necessarily a supernatural aspect. That's just common sense. Make wise choices. You will live a longer life. Okay, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but longing fulfilled is a what? Tree of life. Did you know that the number one cause of death in America is heart sickness? Heart disease. Yeah? Okay, Proverbs 15, 4, A gentle tongue is a tree of life. Okay, your tongue can add years to people's life. Your tongue can take years off of people's life. Your tongue can, your tongue can add years to your life. Your tongue can take away years from your life. 
Now, the problem with this is, like you're saying, well, Pastor Darren, like what are you talking about? Like if, if they didn't continue to engage the tree of life, that somehow there would be like some form of decay. For surely there was no death or decay um, within, uh, within the garden. Fascinating thing is that when God speaks to Adam and says, if you engage with this tree of life, there will be issued a death sentence, okay? Um, we'll look at this here in a, in, 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 in a second. If you have no greater understanding of what death is, that would be like saying to your child, see this, this is a um, Twinkie, okay? And you shall not eat it. For if you do, you will surely wooble booble. And then you leave the, the Twinkie right there. And they're gonna say, surely that Twinkie looks good, it smells good, it's, it seems pleasing to the eyes and to the touch and to the, to the nose. Surely I could eat of that Twinkie for how bad could Wooble Wooble possibly be? How bad could that be? And here we have, God says to, to Adam, you shall not eat of this tree for if you do, surely you will Wooble Wooble. No, Adam had a context for death. At, you know, I'm no plant biologist, but this is what I know, that God gave plants, right, to be eaten, and plants are living things. Yep, they don't, you know, apples don't scream like lobsters when you cook them, but like what, they, they are living never, ne nevertheless, you know, s s you know s living in Seattle, there is a population of people that actually worship vegetation. They cry and mourn and make out with trees, you know, good times. Seattle likes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so here you have, before the fall, you have the Lord giving permission to take of living things and to eat of them. What happens when you eat a living thing? It, it dies. Huh. There's also the argument that perhaps um, Adam even had skin. Now, I do know that there's a teaching out there that says that the skin of Adam um, pre-fall um, was a glowing skin. It was a skin of, of, of light and that when after the fall, God came and covered them in, in actual skin and that's when they, they, they now had this epidermis, which was a layer of decaying skin. I, I don't necessarily, I believe that they were glowing because they were covered in glowing robes of God, perhaps, but I think that Adam says it pretty well when he says, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And there is this idea that perhaps Adam even had an epidermis layer pre-fall, meaning that perhaps even skin cells might die and regenerate. It's not outside of just common sense to say that Perhaps, pre-Genesis 3, there is a grid for decay. There is a grid for uh, regeneration that happens through the death of vegetation, but there is no murder. There's nothing sinister. There's, there's nothing like, like that um, within, within the garden, but this understanding that if I am not engaging with the tree of life, that I understand the context, the ramifications, and the gravity of wooble booble. There's also another tree, and perhaps they had to walk past this tree to get to the tree of life. Now listen, we all are in agreement, okay, that there are things that we are willing to stick up for. There are things that we are willing to fight for. There are things that we live for and things that we die for. Amen? Amen. Glowing skin is not one of those things. No, one, these things that we hold fast to be true is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death. Where the gift of God is life. That we are all in need of forgiveness. That God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever, 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 you're whosoever, and so am I. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish, would have everlasting life. These are the things that we hold true, that the Bible is the authoritative, God-breathed word of God, that we do not get to bend the Bible or change the Bible. We take it literally, amen? We believe that Jesus lived, died, resurrected, ascended, is seated at the right hand of the Father, where he makes intercession for us. Those are things that we are willing to stand up for. Those are things that we're willing to speak up for. Those are things that we're willing to fight for. Those are willing things that we are going to live for, and those are things that we are willing to die for. Glowing skin is not one of them. 
the mystery that surrounds Eden, okay, um, I'm, I'm, uh, exists, and we need to be okay with mystery, okay? <laughs> we read the Bible and we engage it with our imagination. With that being said, the way, the way that I see Eden is this place of the tabernacle of God and I see this place this abiding place this holy of holies and I see this tree of life that is pulsating I I see like the glory of God I I see it like it's like on fire I I see it has fruit living supernatural fruit not Trader Joe's fruit this is like the kind of stuff that only comes from heaven and the tree is alive and it's the very it's the very uh, it's powered by ruach night and day it's not just something that God breathed into it's just like it's alive it's like wah, 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 wah. And, I, and I see it's there's God and he's seated and there's the tree of life and, and, and that's awesome and and, and 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 that's okay that's just how your weirdo pastor sees it okay and and perhaps you would have to walk by this other tree in order to get to the high place to get to the the to the tree of of of, of light now this other tree is called the knowledge of good and evil a lot of us we see this that there's the good tree and the bad tree. There's the, the tree of light and there's the tree that's dark. And there's the tree of life and then there's the tree of death. And you do not eat of the tree of death. No. <laughs> I love it. Come on, come on, come on. There was no tree of death in the garden. The tree of life was good, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good. Any parent here will be able to relate with this. Sometimes there are good things that you tell your children they do not need. What? Because everything in the garden that God had created was good, was tov. So here you have the tree of life, and you can receive it. And here you have another tree, and it is good. But I do not want for you to eat of its fruit. Now, it's interesting. Even the name, knowledge of good and evil, is an interesting name. This is a, this is a mirrorism, which means that it's too contrasting, too, too radically opposite concepts being held together in attention and personified, made manifest in a fruit that you can receive. Do not eat of the fruit of up and down, right? Do not eat of the fruit of near Four. Like this is this is wild. This is this is the 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 fruit okay on a tree, and it's not just of the tree of good, and it's not just the tree of evil. And the way that we teach this to our kids sometimes is there was the good tree and the evil tree. No, there was the life tree, and then there was the tree of good and evil. <laughs> Now, when you look at this good and evil, it's used throughout the Bible, not just in the context of this particular tree. What determines the context of the meaning is the verb that's associated to the meaning. So that means that there can be different contexts for this idea of good and evil coexisting um, together. So if we were to give definition to this tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, we see that one application refers to the judgment or issue related to a decision. The second definition that can come upon this is to listen with discernment to the details of a case so as to judge the legitimacy of a claim. And there's a third application, a third definition that could be used for this tree, and it refers to human capability to be discriminating. So here you have the tree of knowledge and good and evil that perhaps if you eat of its fruit, you receive a supernatural ability to be able to judge on an issue and to make a decision. Equated with this tree is this idea of to be able to discern, to smell. Um, and also we see the human capability to be discriminating. Before Adam and Eve received of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had no discernment. They had no ability to judge right 
from wrong. In fact, Adam and Eve are like the most sheltered people you've ever met in your life. Have you ever known somebody that was just sheltered? This is a couple that had never seen a rated R movie. This is a couple that had never heard a swear word. This is a couple that don't even own a TV. One of those people. They don't even have internet. Here God had prepared for himself image bearers who were innocent. Who were innocent and who had not been exposed to any filth whatsoever. In fact, I'll tell you what we have here in Adam and Eve. We have image bearers who are childlike. Who have not needed maturity. And a father who wants to protect their innocence. Now, here's what we don't know. We don't know what father's long-term plan was for their maturing process. And it is possible, we don't see anything like this written in the word, but it, it's not outside of probability that perhaps a time in the future they would be able to receive from that tree. What we do know is that God said, you don't need discernment. You don't need judgment. You don't need street smarts. Why? Because you have me. This is what I know about my kids. My kids don't have to booby trap their rooms in fear of imposters coming into their rooms and hurting them. You want to know why? They're in my house. And this is what the Lord says. He says, I have provided for you a picture, this, this pre-fall picture of my mercy that will sustain you. It's a picture of who I am, my character and my nature. You come to me and you receive of me. There is this other tree and you do not need it. You do not need to receive of it. Why? Because of our covenant. You are my children. You are my priesthood. You trust me and I will be your judge. You trust me and I will discern for you. We know the rest of the story. We will be studying the serpent. We will be studying the dynamics of temptation. We're going to take our time through this, you guys. This is so big. And, and I, th I think I'm learning, I'm learning so much. So much is, is getting unlocked within me. But I will tell you this, that, that humanity chose to rebel against God. Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, to not trust God. And in this place of receiving the fruit, okay, what was the consequence? That they would surely die. Okay, now the serpent says, you won't die. You won't die. And what we actually see is that when God says you will surely die, this is language that's actually used with the prophet Jeremiah. There's a scene in Jeremiah chapter uh, 26 where Jeremiah gives a prophetic word that's not actually all that popular, okay? Um, in the Bible, prophets would give words that weren't popular, That's a false prophet. Why? He told me something that I didn't like. <laughs> okay. Jeremiah gave a word that wasn't popular. Pop and, and, and what was declared against him? Uh, the same word choice, the same exact Hebrew words, you will surely die, meaning this. You've been issued a death sentence. That here within this place, when God says you will surely die, it's not that you're going to die in that moment. But what happened after they chose to rebel against God? God removed them from Eden, and they no longer had access to the tree of life. At which point, what began happening? They began dying. Okay. All right. Are you ready for this? The author of this book, the seer prophet Moses, made kind of a bad choice. 
made what my wife calls an unwise choice, okay? Killed a guy. Whoops, yep. Ran, okay? Uh, he booked it. He's, he's watching some sheep. He's a fugitive. And guess what? Hi, Chris. Guess what gets his attention? You play something, Chris, until the spirit comes. Guess, get. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I love you. Fugitive, on the run, right? And something gets his attention. What gets his attention? On a hill, a tree. It appears to be on fire. Moses approaches this pulsating, living tree, and a voice comes and says, take off your shoes. Why? Because you're on Eden ground. This man who deserves punishment, this man that deserves judgment, all of a sudden begins to engage with a tree that is similar to the tree of life, and that is a sign of mercy that you deserve judgment, and yet I am offering you redemption. Come to this tree. Come to the tree of life where you will hear the voice of life that will do what? That will awaken you to your identity. Moses, Moses, you didn't create you. Yeah, you screwed some things up, but I have created you, and I have called you. Come to the tree. Take off your shoes. You are on holy ground. I envision the ground as, as full of electricity. I, 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 I can feel the ground just pulsating and, and responding. I think that all of creation was responding to the life that was reverberating and perhaps maybe just maybe that was a reflection or a, a participation of the tree of mercy that was in Eden the tree of life that was in Eden we also know that that generations would rebel against God and they would turn away from God and they would make idols and they'd make idols out of trees and, then, and in many cultures they would even put these idols up in, into trees and, and they would worship they would worship these idols and we even see that 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 God so loves the world that he that he sends his son and he he lives and he dies right and, and but how did he how did he die they they took him up to a hill and there they nailed him to a tree Cursed is one who hangs from a tree that he in his mercy he in his perfection was 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 considered a curse as there on that tree, symbolic of the same tree of mercy that Moses engaged with, symbolic of the same tree of mercy in the garden, the tree of life. Come and eat. Jesus came, and this is who he said. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the tree. I am the tree of life. And that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and he took the cup, and he said, this is no longer bread. This is my body. Come to the tree and eat. He says, this is no longer wine. This is my blood. Take this and drink this. But if you do this once, that is awesome. Hey, that is great. But the similarity is this. In the same way in the garden, that a one-time shot, that a one-time prayer, that a one-time holy moment is not what unlocks life abundantly within your life. You need a lifestyle of coming to the tree of life. You need a lifestyle of receiving from the tree of life. You need a lifestyle. You need a culture. You need a habit. You need to see it as your responsibility, not the responsibility of a conference or a church or a pastor or a television station. It is your responsibility. Why? Because on the moment that Jesus died, the, the, the curtain, the veil that separated unholy bad people, bad, bad people from a holy, holy God, that the moment Jesus, our high priest, died, that veil was torn. Symbolic of this, the fiery sword that has separated Eden from humanity has been removed. That now, unholy people have access to the holy of holies through Christ Jesus, who is our tree of life. You have 
permission to come and to eat of the tree of life. We have access to the tree of life, but it's not a one-time eating. It's not a one-time feasting. This is a lifestyle of coming to the tree and receiving him into us. And Jesus said this, do this often. He said this, do this often. For as often as you do, it's not the fact that you've done it. It's the fact that you do it often. That this is a lifestyle. This is not a tradition. This is a moment that we engage by faith. In this place, that Jesus said, take my body and take it where? Take it into you. I am a tree that you are allowed and invited to feast of. Bring me into you. Bring my fruitfulness. Bring my character. Bring my nature. Bring my abundance. Bring my righteousness into you. Lest you fall into this pattern of always assessing what's good and what's evil. What's evil and what's good. What does a good Christian do? What does a bad person do? I'll make this decision. I won't do that decision. And we live in this place of separation anxiety. We live in this place eating from the wrong tree. We see this crazy dynamic. Good and evil. We see this place of two radical, radical extremes. This place where for the very, for the very first time, Adam and Eve are conscious of their transgressions. They are conscious and overwhelmed by their shame. Good and evil, a double-edged sword, overwhelmed by their, con condemned by shame, and at the same time, completely aware to a degree that they've never had before of the goodness of God, making them feel all the more like a loser, feeling all the more condemned. That this was this, this was this dynamic where God came into the garden, and, and they, they so wanted to be in his presence, and yet they so feared him. This awareness of, you are so perfect, and I am so dark and unclean, for surely you don't want to be, you know, and, and God comes, and he comes to Adam, and he says, Adam, what have you done? And Adam says, that, 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 that woman that you gave me. Simultaneously, at the same time, he, plays the, he blames the woman, and he blames God at the same exact time. Completely unable to take responsibility. Why? Because the very first time in his life, he is crippled by shame. Crippled by shame and completely unable to respond to love in a healthy way. This is what we see in our generation. This is what we see in Seattle. A generation, a city, crippled by shame and unable to receive love. Crippled by the awareness of our transgression. And unable, unable, it, it, it being shamed by the very thought, the very thought that there could be a God makes, makes the people that much angrier. And this is what Jesus says. I am the solution. This is the good news. I am the way out of that dispensation. I am, I am the exit door out of that era of condemnation that, that Paul would say the law brings death, but this gospel, it brings life. And Jesus said, bring this into you. Bring this into you so that it's not just something that you are aware of cognitively, but bring me into you so that I can transform you from the inside out supernaturally and mystically so I can bring you back to that place where you don't know where heaven begins and where earth begins. Like, are, are you a heavenly being? Are you an earthly being? What you just said, was that, was that you or was that God? I don't make that distinction. Did you pray about that? I pray without ceasing. I'm doubting you. I have the mind of Christ. It's not that I'm infallible. It's not that, I, that I'm going to not make mistakes, but I'm stepping into the awareness of his original blueprint for my life. We are stepping into an awakening of our identity and destiny. And it's not just to play in the dirt. It's to be a priesthood of believers, to be a company who prepares a place for God to abide, 
to herald and to exalt this glorious good news that no matter how jacked up you are, <laughs> I get it. I get it. No matter how messed up you think you are, no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, Jesus is the tree of life and you are invited to come and eat, to come and drink, to come and receive him. Paul writes that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, this is no longer bread. This is my body that is broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. We'll, we'll take it together here in a second. He said, this is no longer wine. And by the way, this has never been wine. Never. It would never will. Nobody actually knows what's in this. Okay. He says, this is no longer grape concoction. Fructose. This is, he says, this. This is my blood. Take it. Drink it. Do this often, for as often as you do, you are proclaiming a new covenant dispensation, a new kingdom reality that is alive and changing inside of you. Take it and receive it. And that's what we're going to do today. Let's all stand together. Jesus, we give thanks that you who knew no sin became all of our sin so that we could be holy, righteous priests representing you, preparing a place for your exaltation and preparing a people for your return. We thank you that the day will come, the time will come when you return again. When Eden 2.0 will come down, the tree of life will come down and we will get to partner with you in your original Edenic mandate. That this and all the cosmos would be a temple for the most high exalted God. We celebrate you, King Jesus, and we receive you, our tree of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King Jesus. Let's just give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We receive you, who you are, your life, your abundance, Lord. The frequency of your kingdom, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's not by our might, Lord, nor by our power. It's by your spirit, God. It's by your spirit, Lord. Your life, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's lift up a shout of praise in this room. Woo! Did you want to add anything? I bet you. Yeah. You guys, sit down real quick. Sit down. You guys just welcome, welcome Miss Bonnie. Come on. Do you want to stay down here? Today, I found out if only Andrea Stott had been with Moses, things would have gone a lot differently. There's more where that came from. L listen, <laughs> if you guys need prayer, okay, please come up here. Our team will pray for you. I know I need prayer this morning. All right, so come on up. We'd love to pray for you. Otherwise, God bless you. Get here early. You don't want the unchurched to take your seat, okay? So get here early. All right, bless you.